If you know anything about pythons, it's that they're very big snakes. Burmese pythons somehow found their way to the Everglades in Florida. For an invasive species, the pythons spread fast, and soon enough the Everglades began to change in ways no one ever expected. So what brought the Burmese pythons to Florida? And what did they do to the Everglades? Well, we're about to find out. Hailing from Southeast Asia, particularly Thailand, Vietnam, and Southern China, the Burmese python's diet consists mostly of birds, reptiles, and even small to medium-sized mammals. Now, you might be wondering, how did these snakes get to America? Well, the earliest connection between the USA and Burmese pythons goes way back. Like, way back to the exotic pet trade. During the 1970s and 1980s, the business of bringing in exotic reptiles into the USA grew pretty fast. Burmese pythons have striking pattern scales, and when you first meet them, they're actually quite docile. Because of this, they became popular with reptile enthusiasts. There are even some records that show that between 1996 and 2006, around 99,000 Burmese pythons found their way to the United States. Crazy, right? And the thing is, a large share of them entered through Florida's ports. But there was a problem, and that was their growth. The pythons are a bit more manageable when young, but as they grow, they can grow to over 15 feet in length and weigh more than 100 pounds as adults. As you'd expect, taking care of such a big reptile requires a lot of work and training, and most owners quickly realized that beyond showing off their impressive reptile as a trophy, they didn't have what it took to manage them. They'd bitten off more than they could chew and were either unwilling or unable to take care of them. So what did the owners do? They let them into the wilds. At the same time, some owners completely abandoned their reptile pets while others found theirs had accidentally escaped thanks to negligence. These combined cases signaled the beginning of the python's reign in South Florida. In 1979, authorities confirmed the first wild Burmese python sighting in the Everglade National Park. In other words, it's possible that before public attention turned to the issue, the snakes were already coming in, and the species might have settled in their new environment much earlier than anyone expected. Anyway, throughout the 1980s and early 1990s, the sightings of the Burmese python slowly increased, even though they were sometimes dismissed as one-off cases or even pets that ran away, the numbers continued to rise. Now, there's something else we have to take note of. Most people see 1992 as a major turning point in the python invasion of the Everglades. During this period, a Category 5 storm, Hurricane Andrew, struck South Florida with ruthless force. Besides the damage to the general infrastructure, it also destroyed reptile breeding facilities, and in the destruction, lots of non-native reptiles got loose. While no one knows the exact number, it's not a stretch to believe that the storm released hundreds of snakes into the wetlands. But you have to remember that Burmese pythons existed in the wild before this disaster, so it's likely the hurricane only fast-tracked a problem that was already occurring. By the late 1990s, wildlife officials started noticing just how serious the situation was. Rangers in the Everglades National Park were in for a jump scare when they started finding adult pythons during routine work. Some of them even got caught in tourist trails and roads, which was very alarming. That suggests that when the Burmese pythons settled into the Everglades, their numbers grew really fast, in no small part thanks to how conducive their new environment was. Unlike more northern parts of the country, South Florida turned out to be almost the perfect location for it. The weather is warm, and there's lots of prey for the snakes. In addition, the thick wetlands provided the species with everything it needed to thrive in a new environment that was very similar to Southeast Asia. The Everglades were prime real estate, and by the early 2000s, the python established itself. Furthermore, the pythons were spreading. They extended all the way from the Everglades National Park into Big Cypress National Preserve, and even as far north as Palm Beach County. There were also sightings of the Burmese pythons in other places. However, it's not easy to give an exact figure on the snakes. That's because the snakes are actually difficult to observe as they're mostly nocturnal. They don't show themselves much. They're secretive, excellent at camouflage, and mostly active at night. So observing them directly is really rare, making a headcount nearly impossible. As a result, estimates on their actual numbers vary, but some zoologists believe that there are somewhere between tens of thousands to as many as 300,000 in Florida. That would be a lot of snakes on a plane. 
Another factor behind the python boom was how they reproduced. A single female can lay anywhere from 50 to 100 eggs at once. With so many hatchlings coming from just one snake, the population had plenty of chances to explode. Plus, they reproduce every one to two years. And that was a big issue. At this point, some scientists and officials in the park started noticing a few disturbing trends. Areas where pythons thrived showed that the mammal populations were decreasing. There was a landmark study published in 2012 showing the before and after of the python introduction, and the results were actually very alarming. The raccoon populations declined by 99%, possums by 98%, and bobcats by 88%. Even marsh rabbits and foxes basically disappeared, too. By the mid-2010s, they were practically seen as one of the most pressing environmental challenges Florida was dealing with. The issue with the Burmese pythons had grown into something larger than an isolated, one-off problem of a loose pet. There were ripple effects of the depletion of the local wildlife. One of the challenges that the pythons brought was that they hunted lots of mammals, and as an apex predator, these animals stood no chance against the snakes. Unfortunately, they played an essential role in seed dispersal. They also aerate the soil, which allows oxygen to reach plant roots and serve as prey for native predators. As you can guess, when their numbers plummeted, plants suffered and other hunters starved, creating an ecological gap that was difficult to fill, and that would seriously affect the environment. Yet, that's not all. There were still more unforeseen consequences in the Everglades. Bird populations also suffered. Yes, even the birds weren't spared. The necropsies of some pythons show that aves were part of their diet. Some of these include wading birds, songbirds, and even a few endangered species. And because many of these birds live together in colonies, the python can hunt multiple of them at once when it attacks. Unfortunately, these birds are really important in insect control and nutrient cycling, but that was of no concern to the pythons, who weren't stopping, not anytime soon. It's also surprising to see how two top predators can clash. There have been rare but dramatic encounters between pythons and American alligators, with each capable of overpowering the other. These showdowns highlight how the snakes have become direct rivals to Florida's native apex predators. In addition, some scientists have raised concerns about disease risks. Pythons can carry parasites and pathogens, which might spread to native wildlife in the park. However, much of this is still under study, and researchers are working to confirm how significant the threat really is. But it's not like the Everglades don't have any local snakes, so why did the pythons wreak so much havoc? Well, it's because of the unique environment they invaded. The Everglades region is a World Heritage Site. It's a very biodiverse spine hot spot, too. That means the disruption of its balance harmed local wildlife and threatened global conservation priorities. Fortunately, there were a few strategies that Florida put in place to manage the snake populations. One of the earliest ways they tried to capture the snakes was with something called research-driven capture and monitoring. Basically, biologists put radio transmitters on the pythons they captured. Afterwards, they sent the snakes back into the wild to see their movements and find other snakes. This is called the Judas snake technique. Despite some success, this method still wasn't enough to reduce the snake population. In addition, another method is public involvement. So in 2010, Florida came up with the Python Challenge. It's a hunting competition that lets the public capture and get rid of snakes. Different people all come together to raise awareness on the snake problem. They also remove lots of snakes every year, like we're talking hundreds to even thousands of Burmese pythons. Also, there are some other similar incentive programs like state contracts. These programs pay professional hunters every hour. They're also paid by the size of the snakes they need to remove. These efforts led to thousands of pythons being captured over the years. Other things like specialized removal programs are growing bigger, specifically through partnerships with federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service. They use professionals trained to patrol important areas. Snake teams usually work at night because that's when the pythons are active. Scientists also experiment with lots of different tech. They have drones with thermal cameras and scent-tracking dogs. There's even genetic testing now to detect and track Burmese pythons, which I think is super cool. But 
even with such progress, these tools are still super limited, especially when trying to get rid of all the snakes. As a result, despite the number of Burmese pythons removed each year, those captured are still a fraction of their entire population in the Everglades. That's why regulating the pet trade is another priority. Since Burmese pythons first established themselves as a threatening invasive species, Florida and the federal government imposed stricter rules on ownership and importation. For instance, in 2012, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the Burmese python as an injurious species under the Lacey Act. So it's basically illegal to import or move them across state lines under federal law. Florida has also tightened its own rules, making it nearly impossible to own a Burmese python without special permits. These regulations are meant to stop any new introductions, even though the damage from the existing invasion is still being felt. Education campaigns play a supporting role, too, as the state works to inform the public about the dangers of releasing exotic pets into the wild. They also aim to inform people about how much the snakes damage the ecology. Outreach materials emphasize that owning large snakes comes with long-term responsibility while showing the multiple risks. Despite years of dedicated effort, eradicating all the Burmese pythons in Florida is still a tall order, even with the current tools and resources. Most of the snake's qualities make it impossible to totally remove them from the Everglades. Instead, most programs are focused on how to suppress and contain the population, and these efforts have seen some success. Tens of thousands of pythons have been removed since formal control programs began. At the same time, public awareness of invasive species issues in Florida continues to grow really fast. However, experts still warn that for every python captured, there are still many more that remain hidden in the wetlands. Even though it's been years since the Burmese pythons were released into the wild, Florida is still finding it hard to deal with the consequences. The invasion changed the Everglades ecosystem permanently. Scientists tell us that the effects will stay for generations to come, and unlike some other invasive species, the python isn't showing any signs that it's going to decline naturally. Plus, we mustn't forget that there are still the long-term concerns of living with the Burmese pythons. One of the most pressing concerns is that the Everglade biodiversity will keep decreasing. The small and medium-sized mammals really bore the brunt of the python's introduction. If declines like that happen to spread to birds, reptiles, and amphibians, then Everglades could lose more of the wildlife diversity that truly defines it, and this would be a great ecological loss. More than that, it would also be a cultural and economic loss, and that's because the Everglades is a World Heritage Site and a source of tourism revenue. Moreover, there's the financial part of managing this entire operation. The cost of dealing with the ripple effects of an invasion is expensive. Millions of dollars are spent on activities like removal programs, research projects, and public outreach. But regardless of all the efforts, the snake population is already too deeply rooted. That means governments need to dedicate more resources to the problem, which will put a strain on the state and federal budgets as well. Let's not forget the cost of technology from the innovative approaches that people are exploring. Like I mentioned before, some researchers are investigating genetic technologies. They're basically trying to find a way to stop the pythons from reproducing. Think of it as an assisted natural decline. Some researchers are also testing out pheromone traps. Now, these traps are meant to draw snakes into controlled areas where they'll be captured. However, the idea is still an experiment and only in its early stages. But it's a real shift towards solutions that'll have long-term effects. It's a real advancement away from the endless cycle of catching snakes by hand. And their success will really depend on how to balance technological effectiveness with ecological safety, because these methods and interventions are risky, too. The main thing is that agencies, scientists, and even the public still need to collaborate with each other. It's actually essential that they all do. The scale of the Everglades makes it impossible for any single group to address the problem on their own or to do anything significant about it by themselves. What's best is that the continued partnerships between various organizations, universities, and local communities offer the best chance for coordinated responses. In the future, the most realistic outcome is not the eradication of pythons, but long-term coexistence under manageable conditions. 
Therefore, efforts should be comfortable and likely focus more on protecting the most vulnerable species, slowing the spread of the snakes, and reducing their overall numbers whenever it's possible. While the Everglades may never fully return to its pre-Python state, there's currently ongoing debate on how much large-scale suppression can help. It's clear that everything everyone is doing to help with the management potentially helps preserve key parts of the ecosystem and limit further losses. Even with all these management efforts, the sheer size of some pythons still manages to shock researchers and the public alike. Record-breaking captures have become a striking reminder of just how well the snakes have adapted to Florida. We already know these snakes can grow huge, but the individuals found in Florida over the years have pushed the limits of what anyone thought possible. In 2022, for example, biologists with the Conservancy of Southwest Florida captured a Burmese python that measured nearly 19 feet long and weighed 215 pounds, making it the heaviest ever recorded in the state. That's longer than a giraffe is tall and heavier than a professional football player. And it's not just a one-off. Every few years, new largest python ever stories surface from Florida's wetlands. In 2012, a 17-foot female carrying 87 eggs was discovered, showing how a single snake can potentially produce dozens of hatchlings at once. In 2023, hunters with Florida's Python Challenge caught an 18-foot giant that took several people just to lift. These captures prove two things. The snakes are thriving, and they're continuing to reach sizes that rival their wild cousins in Southeast Asia. The drama of finding and removing such massive animals has even turned into a kind of cultural phenomenon. Photos of hunters posing with enormous pythons go viral. News outlets love to cover the latest record, and the state uses these moments to keep attention on the invasive species crisis. It's a strange twist. The same snakes wreaking havoc on Florida's ecosystems also generate fascination and even tourism as people sign up for guided python hunts to try their luck at catching a giant. All of this adds to the bigger picture. Burmese pythons in Florida aren't just an ecological issue, they've become part of the state's modern story, a mix of scientific challenge, environmental struggle, and larger-than-life encounters straight out of a nature documentary. The Burmese pythons of the Everglades have grown from escaped pets into record-breaking giants, reshaping South Florida's ecosystems and even its culture. What do you think? Is there any way to truly control them, or are they now a permanent part of the landscape? Share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video.